Excellent. Uh, so, hello, uh, my name's Chris Harvey. I'm a lecturer at the University of Oxford, uh, lecturing on sleep medicine. Uh, for the last four years, my focus has been on public engagement and education for the SCNI. Uh, and it was based on that that Mary asked me to come and speak to this title, Sleep and Public Policy, Bridging the Gap with What the Public Want to Know. So this quote here, I think, summarises quite nicely where sleep medicine is in terms of policy. Although the health, economic and quality of life consequences of insufficient sleep and disturbed sleep are well known within the sleep medicine community, we possess limited ability to drive broad cultural change. A revolution of sleep health will require the sustained collaboration of multiple stakeholders as well as endorsement of highly visible exemplars and champions of sleep. Uh, so over the last few decades, there's been an explosion in sleep research and in sleep medicine, uh, but we've seen very little change in sleep policy outside of um, sleep apnea, um, hypersomnia and, and uh, driving mainly. So this is briefly what I'm going to cover today. Um, last talk of the, what has been a very informative two days, which of course means we're all exhausted. So you may be pleased to know that I have been criticised in the past for flying through my talks. <laughs> so hope we'll finish time. So I'll talk a little bit about attitudes to sleep and what the public want to know. Um, and then I'm going to focus really on the projects that we've worked in across education and public engagement. My groups of interest, which are adolescents, talking about the Teen Sleep Project, shift workers through some engagement work that we've run over the last three or four years, and then the work we're doing with medics and clinical practitioners. Um, a lot of this isn't directly policy, but working with um, institutions who could help us drive policy forward um, in research-based ways. So obviously, attitudes to sleep change over time, change as a function of culture, as a function of commerce. Uh, two contrasting quotes here, sleep is a golden chain that ties health and our bodies together. If you've seen Russell's TED talk, you will be familiar with these quotes. That's where I got them. <laughs> um, I love that quote because I think it only really is now that we're beginning to understand uh, exactly how strong that chain is between sleep uh, and health. Um, fast forward to the Industrial Revolution, uh, the advent and the uh, popularization of um, fake light where we can control our environment. Edison seems a criminal waste of time and a heritage from our cave days. And I would argue that as a society, this is the attitude that we're still fighting against. More contemporaneously, uh, so you can tell that there's a, a liberal-based joke about to happen. Wait for it. <laughs> you have Thatcher, sleep is for wimps. Uh, and then Donald Trump, um, how can anyone do anything if they are sleeping for more than four hours a day? Both famously uh, four hour a night sleepers. Um, and children of really the 80s financial boon. Uh, where this idea that going without sleep was somehow a badge of honour. So I think these quotes very much represent where or where we are or where we're coming out of as a society and how we view sleep. What I really think they represent, though, <laughs> is the idea that poor sleep, shortened sleep, uh, lowers your empathy and probably impacts emotional regulation. So that's the joke. I can't believe you didn't laugh at that. <laughs> um, However, I think the tide is turning um, in terms of how the public view sleep, in terms of how funding bodies view sleep. Um, some publications which are up here, not because I endorse them in any way, uh, but because I think they represent uh, a public desire for knowledge around sleep. You have Matt Walker's book, Why We Sleep, which is really a, a book about the science of sleep, primarily. And then Anna Huffington's book, The Sleep Revolution, which is really uh, a person's story about how neglecting sleep really led to um, uh, nervous breakdown essentially. And then you have the Royal Society for Public Health, published uh, last year, I think, with Colin Ethby, waking up to the health benefits of sleep. Initially outlines um, where sleep's important for society, why it matters, and the overall aim here is to get sleep on the public health agenda in the same way that we think about smoking, alcohol, caffeine, exercise, that sleep should be one of these uh, key health behaviours. Um, <clears throat> and so I think we can see that that tide is starting to turn. Um, obviously, changes in public opinion have gone alongside, changes in science not always in the same direction, but our understanding of sleep has improved vastly. Um, the, one of the very first textbooks of sleep where sleep is viewed as a passive state um, and not really useful for much. Um, and in this quote, which is quite out of date now, <laughs> um, but Alan Hobson, uh, we've learned more in the past 60 years than we have in the past 6,000, and that is just getting more and more true sleep 
the sleep field and as we've seen over the last two days, our knowledge is growing exponentially. And I think it is that growth in science and science communication that fuels public interest. So this graph is essentially meaningless, but I wanted to find some way to demonstrate the public interest in sleep is growing over the last 20 years or so. This is basically the percent of internet pages that contain the word sleep um, from the year 2000 to 2017. And you can see it fluctuates. You might say it has an annual oscillating rhythm. You might not. Uh, but the general pattern is, is one of growth. Um, you can also look at the... You can also look at the uh, media, the amount of headlines and the, the focus on sleep in the news. Um, and this varies from reports on science, but mostly it focuses on things like the cost of sleep deprivation, how much sleep you need, um, and the idea that we're not getting enough sleep, that sleep leads to all kinds of negative outcomes. This, of course, leads to the favourite story that we're in the middle of a sleep crisis, uh, that we're sleeping less now than we were uh, 50 years ago. Um, people here are showing 1985 versus 2012, um, and the amount of people sleeping, the ideal sleep length, um, has diminished. This then has, has, has fueled uh, nationwide international anxiety around sleep, I would say. Um, it's not necessarily true. There's plenty of data showing that actually sleep hasn't changed that much um, over the last 50 years, that in fact we're sleeping better. Uh, you might also look, for example, at the work of Jerome Siegel working in um, non-industrialised tribes uh, around the equator who's shown that sleep, the thesis of this work, is that these tribes represent ancest ancestral sleep. That's how we would have slept pre-industrialization. And what you actually see is that sleep, their sleep, they sleep in one block, they sleep for around six hours, um, and so in fact we are sleeping better, if the idea is that these people represent um, ancestral sleep. However, sleep disturbance is increasing. So I don't think sleep length is necessarily the go-to factor, uh, or what we need to be concerned with. Uh, the number of prescriptions for sleep medication is increasing, um, so there is arguably an increase in sleep anxiety. So I would say then, where we're at uh, from a public, from a sociological perspective, is this sort of Janus-based uh, interpretation of sleep and sleep medicine. On the one hand, sleep is the ultimate performance enhancer, is one message that people have. They understand the value of sleep. Uh, a group of people who are trying to promote sleep. This kind of thinking leads to the proliferation of devices, wearables, to constantly monitor sleep. Um, working with the public, one thing I get often now is, oh, my watch tells me I'm in you know, four or five hours of deep sleep a night. Uh, should I be getting more? And obviously, their watch can't tell them that. And so I think it's interesting talking about the development of new devices and devices that can gather even more data. I think you run a risk of creating health anxiety that doesn't need to be there if there isn't also education alongside it. Countering this, you also have the attitude that sleep is for wimps uh, and that getting by without sleep somehow makes you a kind of superhero. Um, and this feeds into the sleep industry, the wellness industry, um, and people's jobs now kind of depending on our sleep anxiety. So when it comes to what the public actually want to know, what kind of questions we're asked, if you look at what the top 10 questions people Google about sleep, this date is from 2016, these are the top 10 questions that come out. And I would argue you could categorize these in two ways. Sleep crisis questions, why can't I sleep? Snoring surgery, which I know isn't a question. Uh, <laughs> no sleep, how long can you go without sleep? How to sleep, best way to sleep, sleeping too much. These are all things around things going wrong with sleep, or how to cure the problem of sleeping at all. And then maybe sleep curious questions. Why do we sleep? Do fish sleep? <laughs> and uh, why do we dream? Uh, and this very much does represent the kind of questions you get when you're working with the public. Um, typically, it's about how to get better sleep. Am I sleeping well enough? So I think that's where we're at uh, with sleep medicine from a public perspective uh, in terms of attitudes and opinions. Now I want to talk about specific projects that I've been involved in, which really aim to bring sleep into institutions and may represent ways in which sleep medicine could become part of policy and education um, and perhaps um, uh, in, the, uh, uh, in industry. So I'm going to start with the Teen Sleep Project. Um, 
And I'm not going to labour the background to this too much, because I assume you're mostly familiar with, with these concepts. But adolescence leave is interesting because there is a change in adolescence from the age of 10 until about 21, where the circadian system delays, so your um, sleep timing gets later and later, your sleep need gets longer, uh, and your sleep drive changes, so you become less sensitive to the effects of the sleep homeostat. All of this basically culminates in, oh, sorry, and then you also have the behavioural and societal factors, uh, device use, um, more independence, less regulated bedtimes by parents, um, and all of this combines to, lead to create um, quite extreme sleep deprivation. Most adolescents are losing roughly two hours a night um, and then getting some recovery sleep at the weekend. A lot of the work we did with teachers before starting this project, a lot of the focus group work, uh, what was clear is that the teachers really do value sleep in their students. They see it as a positive thing for education and for engagement. So you have the support of the teachers and typically the schools when it comes to sleep education. What you don't have their support for is changing the school start time. <laughs> so our initial proposal was that we shifted the school start day from 9 until 10, and they would finish at 4, rather than 3. Uh, and this was advertised so widely. We spent so much money on recruitment and advertising and press releases. Uh, had a huge media presence, this study. And basically every school told us to go fly. So they would not sign up to a randomised control trial in which a delayed school start time was part of it. Their reasons were initially, or firstly, they want to see the evidence that it works before they implement it. So then you're in a catch-22, we don't have the evidence, we can't get it to implement it, um, and then a lot of it was practical stuff, around bus timetables, teacher contracts, things like that. So what we did instead, uh, so initially we were going to look at the delayed school start time, coupled with a sleep education programme. So we dropped the delayed school start time and focused on a sleep education program, um, which schools leapt at. Schools, we, we went from not being able to recruit at all to being overrun. So there was a real appetite for this. The primary aim was to assess, the evalu uh, to evaluate the impact of the teen sleep education program on adolescent sleep. So this is a pilot study, essentially. Does it improve sleep? Has to be your first question. And the secondary aim was to look at improvements in well-being and mental health. So the package itself started off with the science of sleep, what is sleep, why is it important, uh, how it changes in adolescence, making it relevant for them, sleep hygiene, uh, I'm sure you're all aware of what the sleep hygiene um, processes are, and then sleep management, stress management, which really was very um, neurotic thought, recognition and neutralisation, um, de-stressing, uh, neutralising worries and thoughts, that kind of thing, tools that they can take outside the classroom. Uh, these are the lesson titles, so you can see what was covered in each lesson. So that broadly was the package. Uh, it was designed to be interactive, colourful, uh, non-directive, so there was no, you can't do this, you must do that. It was very much, well, reflect on this, discuss this, experiment with this. So we would give them a task and encourage them to experiment and try out different things in their own sleeping environments. Uh, student workbook, which had all the tasks and the homework and the assignments and then the teacher handbook, which had a more elaborated information. Because this was delivered by teachers. We trained the teachers to then deliver this, which is an important point. So this wasn't delivered by sleep experts. This was delivered by teachers that we trained, who then cascaded the training down to their colleagues. Um, so we had to make sure there was enough information in the teacher book that they could actually answer the questions <laughs> they might be asked. Uh, we monitored sleep in a subsample of the students who took part for two weeks before and after the intervention using sleep diaries. This is based on the consensus sleep diary, but we modified it for adolescents. Um, in our initial feasibility study, adolescents did not understand how to fill out a sleep diary. They, got it, they were very confused about it. Uh, so we changed it so they filled half in before they went to sleep and half in when they woke up. Uh, and that really improved our return rate. And then active watches for two weeks alongside the sleep diary. So what were our results across 10 schools in England? The first thing I want to point out, and I think this is important for a feasibility, scalability perspective when you're thinking about anything to do with, with working with schools or making something a standard part policy, is that no two schools delivered this intervention in the same way. From a research point of view, that is really, really frustrating, and they were all told to deliver it in the same way. <laughs> uh, but they didn't, but luckily we had a note of how they delivered it. And what we found is that all schools did get through the lessons, they found a way to fit it in. Um, but because of the way the package is designed, they were able to fit it to their own situation. 
Um, so as I say, from a research point of view, that's, that can be frustrating because you need to then deal with that in analysis. Um, but from a usability point of view, from an outreach point of view, that's fantastic. In terms of uh, sleep, this is a subjective sleep time. So each line represents a different school. And you see basically what you'd expect to see, um, high, high variability in sleep durations, similar sleep pattern where you see this massive recovery sleep at the weekend and the social jet lag of around two hours. So that's not a new story. That just really confirms everything we know about adolescent sleep. So I guess it's good to know that teens in England are sleeping the same as those in America, which is where most of the data comes from. Subjective total sleep time, um, again, with the sleep diary, differs from weekends to weekdays. Um, what we ask the students on the sleep diary, which you don't usually ask, is if you could sleep for longer, how much longer would you sleep for? Um, and on average, they said they would sleep um, for about just over an hour longer uh, on weekdays, taking them up to nearly nine hours, which is the recommended uh, sleep amount for this uh, developmental period, and slightly less on the weekends because they are getting more sleep. So we quite like that because what they were telling us unprompted, this is before the education intervention, uh, is that they feel they would want around about nine hours sleep. So that is the, that's, I'm going to talk about the baseline sleep. Uh, we also gathered a whole load of questionnaire data that I'm not going to go into. Uh, but pre to post intervention, what did we find? So we gave them a sleep quiz at the start and the end of the intervention. Um, we improved sleep knowledge. So at the very basic, that's what you want a sleep education intervention to do. Uh, their knowledge about sleep did improve. Uh, they didn't know they were going to be tested post intervention. Uh, so they weren't encouraged to revise. They weren't encouraged to study. Uh, but in terms of sleep outcomes, what did we find? We saw small improvements in the sleep uh, condition indicator, small improvements in the sleepiness scale, and small improvements in the ashes, which is a scale looking at behavioral uh, sleep-related behaviors, sleep hygiene behaviors designed for adolescents. These results, although significant, aren't really clinically meaningful, uh, bearing in mind that the population is highly variable, the amount of sleep. Uh, that each that the students are getting is, is very variable from, from individual to individual. So then we looked at the poor sleepers, uh, which is who this intervention should really be targeting. Uh, so based on the sleep condition indicator, we took out those who have probable insomnia and what effect do you see then? And in those who had probable insomnia based on SCI scores, um, pre and post intervention, 52% of them are no longer in the probable insomnia intervention, suggesting that for poor sleepers, sleep education may represent one way in which you can prevent the onset of sleep disorders through adolescence. Um, and again, you see the reduced sleepiness uh, in the, those that had poor sleep. Uh, and those that had good sleep or in the full sample, you see an increase in sleepiness over term. But in the good sleepers, you see this decrease related to sleep improving. You see small improvements in the uh, sleep hygiene scale. So this implies that there is some kind of behavior change happening uh, related to this uh, education intervention. So the conclusions from this, the teen sleep study so far are that large scale collection of sleep, wake and wellbeing data from teenagers across multiple schools is feasible with relatively limited resources. This wasn't a well-funded study. Um, and schools have no money. Um, like I was quite shocked at how terrible schools in the UK actually are. <laughs> <laughs> going around them all. Teenagers are not getting enough sleep. This, this backs up what we already know about adolescent sleep. They're sleep deprived roughly two hours every night. Um, they have recovery sleep at the weekends. Um, and you see an improvement in self-report measures pre to post. Uh, and what we really want to follow up here then is education, a potential preventative intervention. So though it's not having a massive impact for everyone and those who are most likely to be affected by sleep uh, going forward, it does seem to be having an improvement. Obviously, what we want to do next are large-scale longitudinal studies uh, looking at mental health outcomes over the transitional period. So going from school into the workplace and into university where um, depression and anxiety tend to spike, does, prevent, does um, protecting sleep uh, prevent the onset of those disorders? That could be the real um, benefit of this type of intervention. Obviously, there are many limitations. This was a pilot study. Um, I mean, the biggest pilot study I've ever, <laughs> ever seen, but according to the funders, a pilot study, 1,000 odd students, no control schools. Uh, the education package was delivered very differently. Um, and the activity subsample were talking about good sleepers, but I didn't present the activity data, so you don't need to worry about that. So that's the work we've been doing on adolescents. Um, obviously, 
uh, very nascent. There's a lot still to be done, but I think there's some quite promising results there um, and a package that could be delivered to schools easily. Uh, we're looking at ways that we could perhaps make this available online, for example, um, and with minimal input from researchers. The other group I've been really interested in over the last few years is shift workers. This has mostly been through public engagement work, so there's not a lot of data to present here, um, but really just thinking about how we've built relationships with industry, the appetite from industry, uh, and the recognition from industry in improving sleep in the workers. Um, because there is, there is appetite there for input at this level. So just some background. We know that shift work um, is potentially dangerous. Most of the uh, major industrial disasters have been attributed to fatigue or um, excess sleepiness or have happened at um, a point in the day attributed to accidents in the skating phase um, and car crashes tend to peak. Um, so working while you're sleepy can have very real, or fatigue can have very real um, world consequences. At the, end of, at the level of the industry, um, we know that your productivity over the week um, is variable, it starts off very low, uh, so the black line are the night shift workers, and you can see that their, their productivity, although it catches up towards the end of the week once they've adjusted, um, there's a real period of lag, so there's a reduced productivity. And we also know that there's massive health outcomes, negative health outcomes associated with shift work. Uh, cancer, obesity, diabetes, ulcers, cardiovascular disease, not to mention the psychosocial impacts, which gets maybe less airtime, uh, but which is what I'm more interested in. Reduced quality of life, there's an increased divorce rate in shift workers, um, poorer school performance in their children, behavioural problems in their children, reduced social interaction, and reduced work satisfaction. And as you can imagine, this all basically leads to increased depression. Uh, these are some of the quotes, that, uh, choice quotes that we had from the shift workers that we worked with. Um, and what really struck me is the, the isolation that comes out of these quotes, that no one understands them and they should do it, you just don't get it. They're angry all the time um, and they have no life. Uh, a lot of what we have done in terms of trying to build interventions with shift workers is to create communication channels, is to get them talking to each other for social support. Um, and also normalising some of the things that they feel. So explaining to them that you're angry all the time because of your emotion regulation at this time of day, for example, and the importance of sleep. Um, and that you actually can control that, giving them a sort of locus of control. Um, or the techniques that we found most effective at this anecdotal level. So the project that we worked on is called The Night Club, because obviously we wanted to make it seem fun. <laughs> Um, and this is a collaboration between us, uh, a company called The Liminal Space, uh, Imperial, so uh, Mary and I worked together on this, and the Imperial medical students who presented earlier, and the co-op, the cooperative um, grocers at a warehouse in Thurrock, uh, which isn't a place you need to visit. So the overall project objectives uh, were really to get a sense of feasibility and how to communicate with this population in an effective way. So we weren't wanting to run in and just start doing some research and be, you know, arrogant scientists who know better. Uh, this population are typically very, very hard to reach population. Um, and I think when we talk about shift work and when we research shift work, we talk about it as though it's a homogenous thing, but shift work is very heterogeneous. Most of the research is done on medics, nurses, pilots, people at the upper end of the socioeconomic ladder. Um, the people we were working with are very much at the lower end of the socioeconomic ladder. Some of them don't have English, a lot of them um, have a lot of health problems, uh, a lot of them are working two or three jobs. So it's not just the shift work, it's all that other stuff associated with allostatic load that you're fighting against as well. Um, so we wanted to explore how to communicate relevant science in a way that would be meaningful um, to these people and that could potentially improve their well-being. Working successfully with industry, so building stakeholder relationships and use creative engagement techniques. Um, but also think about ways that we could generate research data and proper evaluation data uh, to push this forward at the end of the project. So these are some of the topics that we covered. How to use light to control the night, so that was about light exposure. Uh, and I'll talk more about what we did around light exposure in a minute. Uh, we talked about their own body clock 
Again, the people we were working with were on constant nights, and a lot of them had been for a long time. So their circadian preference tended to be towards the hour end, because again, it's a self-selecting population. If you can't do it after a few months, you just can't do it. Um, but explaining how that works and how that interacts with light. Um, sleep hygiene, again. Uh, and then we spoke a lot about diet, and this was something they really, really clung to, was the diet aspect. I think because this is something that they could really easily control. Um, and explaining to them how the circadian system drives craving um, and how you need to get around that by substituting the craving uh, for healthier foods. Uh, and that was something that, that, that represents, I think, an interesting intervention for them. We also gathered some pilot data looking at the effect of bright lights using, look at that handsome chappy, these uh, glasses, uh, these <laughs> bright light goggles. These have been developed by um, Leon Lack. Uh, and there's quite a lot of data already behind these. Uh, and basically, they substitute sad lamps. Um, they're a bit more convenient than sad lamps. You can wear them. You can walk around. Uh, they don't hurt your eyes in the way that sad lamps do. Um, and so we gathered some pilot data to see um, wearing these at the start of a shift. Does that uh, improve your mood, your alertness, your error rate? Um, and so participants wore them for two weeks and monitored their mood and their alertness at the start and end of a shift. Um, one week without, one week with the glasses. So very simple um, project. Again, this was designed as, as an engagement project, not a research project. Uh, but we're hoping to grow it and use what we have as pilot data, as, as feasibility data. We do see small changes in self-rated tiredness and reductions in day-to-day -day variation in tiredness across the shift. So this might represent a feasible and ecological way to improve safety, at least in the night shifting population. So I think what we learned from this project is that industry partners are willing to invest in novel ways to educate around sleep. Uh, the co-op now wants us to roll out this project across the whole of the UK. Um, and we're bringing new partners on board. We're working with Thames Water, CFL, Transport for London, um, John Lewis, and potentially Sainsbury's. So there is an appetite for sleep education out there. The issue is there's not enough people to deliver it. So just to give you an idea of the work that went into that night shift project, it was us going to co-op and working the night shift from 9 at night till 9 in the morning, uh, and then traipsing back to Oxford. <laughs> um, so it's a, it's a lot of work. Um, there are probably more efficient ways to do this, but I think what we've demonstrated is that there is an appetite for it and that the workers appreciate it. Um, the employers are willing to support behaviour change, so they're considering now things like changing the lighting in the warehouses, which I think would really help because the warehouses are dimly lit um, and they're either really warm or freezing. Uh, and then food availability, the food that you get is basically chips and pasta uh, from the canteen. <laughs> um, and in terms of the feedback, we have a lot of feedback that is, this has been independently evaluated by the Wellcome Trust and by the Liminal Space. I don't have all the feedback yet, but from what I have seen, 80% have claimed to learn something new, and some have indicated behaviour change, but I'll have a more detailed analysis of the feedback soon. So that was the night shift project that we're working on. I think the point I want to make around all that is that there are huge variations in what shift work is that we know a lot from the research data, but there's not a lot coming out about how you actually go about applying it, applying it. So what we're trying to do now is build our relationships with stakeholders to find novel ways. Um, and there is an appetite out there. But what we need now are people who are trained to deliver it, because there isn't, enough, there isn't a big enough pool of sleep medicine experts to really fill the, the, the gap and the appetite for sleep knowledge. So the other area that I focus on is professional and medical knowledge um, in sleep. So I indicated earlier that we may or may not be in the midst of a sleep crisis. Um, prescriptions for sleep uh, and sleep-related disorders are on the increase, so there is a demand for more sleep medicine. Um, and probably there are different ways that we can tackle that problem. Uh, one is maybe through a step care model of treatment where you don't need expertise to treat the biggest number of people. So this is Colin Espy's work. Um, Colin is part of our lab at the SCNI. Uh, so you would start off with end step treatment, which in Colin's model was basically online treatment, online platforms for cognitive behavioural therapy for insomnia. So those who have the least complex need go in at this very basic level and get distance intervention. Those that have more complex needs go up the pyramid 
and then see those who have more expertise towards the top. So it limits the burden on the expertise base. Um, and we've seen from some of the work that Colin's done that this online intervention is uh, effective in improving insomnia, uh, also effective in improving depression and anxiety. It's also been shown to be effective in um, shift work disorder. Uh, so there's another point I was going to make there, but I got distracted. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so there's an online intervention that uh, can be done from a distance. The other way that we're trying to tackle this is uh, through education. Uh, so this is a bit cheeky, but I'm just going to point out the uh, master's program or the postgraduate program that we are running at Oxford. And the point of this is to educate medics and psychologists primarily on sleep disorders. Uh, and again, this runs online. And the aim here is to train as many medics who are interested uh, in sleep medicine to fill that training gap. Most medics get around half an hour training on sleep throughout their medical training. Um, and so this is filling the gap from the other side of that pyramid, bulking up the expertise. Um, oh, the other thing, I want, the point I was going to make about this and about online interventions in terms of policy is that there is no movement in the NHS to provide these interventions within certain NHS trusts. So I think um, distance learning and reducing the expertise burden is something that is very appealing uh, at that policy level in the NHS. So my conclusions overall are that there's a growing appetite for sleep health, education and intervention. By intervention, I don't necessarily mean medical intervention, but I mean expert intervention uh, in terms of support and making changes. There are feasible and scalable ways to fill the knowledge gap via education at the school level, education at the expertise level, and through online um, treatments. Um, it's still relatively nascent uh, policy in sleep medicine. Uh, it needs much more research and evaluation. As I say, the policy that exists tends to exist around driving, uh, flying, uh, narcolepsy, and, and apnea, really. So I just want to quickly thank my collaborators on the Teen Sleep Project, uh, co-PIs Colin and Russell at the SCNI, Rachel and Gabby, who gathered most of the data, our advisors, the schools we worked with, and then our collaborators on the, um, the nightclub project, the Physiological Society, Liminal Space, Imperial College, and the lady herself. <laughs> thank you very much. So I'll take any questions if there are any. Congratulations. Um, you know, I know how hard field studies are and a lot of work, and then you get very little. Uh, is this on? No. I was just congratulating you on, on that. Um, <laughs> and I don't want them to miss that. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I am, and I think uh, my experience also tells me that, yes, there's a really good appetite in the shift work environment, you know, and, and indeed they they have a lonely path and they're a heterogeneous group, like you say. Um, I, I, it's a discussion, really, about, yes, let's engage and, and do the things you're doing. Uh, my concern, though, is that sometimes, and, and this shouldn't stop you or us, but sometimes we don't have the science yet to really give the good advice. Um, you know, they always say, which lights should we use and when? And actually, we hardly know. As you say, so many different shift patterns. Mm -hmm. And then talking about food, when would be the best time to eat to, to minimize, you know, the, this abnormal eating time and the raised tag levels. You know, we, we have some idea from lab work. So my concern is that if we're going to go in, you know, we need to think of things that won't do any harm uh, and, and, and sort of slowly build up and get better. But my, my biggest worry is, you know, that point about eat melatonin-rich foods, that just doesn't hold up. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, we don't want to say the wrong thing either. Yeah. Uh, and just to clarify, that point about melatonin rich foods was taken off the final flyers. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so that was that, that yeah. Um, no, I completely agree. I think the, a lot of the questions you get, we don't fully have answers for. Um, a lot of the advice that we give 
uh, especially in shift population, are things that we know will be healthy for them generally. So we don't really talk about um, when is the best time to eat. We talk about substituting the craving you have having for healthier foods um, and preparing so that those things are, are available. Um, so absolutely, we can't always answer the questions. Uh, in terms of that preventing us from doing something, I would say there are already people giving bad advice. There's a huge industry built around this. So I think it's better that we go in with some cautious advice and do it properly um, than let the bad advice take over. Because as scientists, researchers, we're never really going to feel that we have the answer <laughs> anyway. Um, and I think it's better we do it cautiously than they do it badly. Another question? Quick, can I get up here? Uh, thank you, Dr. Hassi. Uh, Harvey. Um, uh, I was just wondering, like, if you had any insights on uh, when, on the self-reported versus uh, the uh, actual measures of, uh, of uh, sleep duration, because maybe, like, for example, I self-reported that I slept for, um, for example, nine hours, and I actually had, uh, I actually had, um, for example, six hours of sleep. But then my performance is better uh, than when I self-reported and accurately self-reported six hours of sleep. Do you have any insights on that? Uh, I think in terms of your subjective impression of your sleep and your objective impression of your sleep, um, we're not always great at being accurate, but that varies depending on patient groups. So we know, for example, that insomnia patients tend to really underestimate their sleep. Uh, time. Um, good sleepers tend to underestimate how long it takes them to fall asleep. So there are, there are, there are variances in, in, your, in your objective and subjective measures. And then I guess it really comes down to how objective your objective measures are. So activity isn't an objective measure of sleep. It's an objective measure of movement. Um, and then you're drawing inferences from that. Um, so you're not really saying the objective measure of sleep disagrees with your subjective measure. You're saying the objective measure of how still you are. And I think with these wearable devices, that's something you really need to be aware of, is what it is they're actually measuring. Emmanuel's got a question. <laughs> exactly, I mean, you really want to have, you know. <laughs> I had a question about, you know, in, in definitely in the US right now, one of the big issues is suicide in teenagers, um, so, they have a lot of effort in trying to prevent suicide. So I was just wondering if there's any effort in looking at this, uh, you know, in the UK, either with people who are sleep teenagers, with sleep deprived, or with a workload and, uh, you know, uh, and delayed sleep phase and insomnia, et cetera. But I mean, there's probably different groups, but nightmares. Yeah. I mean, you, you know a little bit the literature. I mean, you probably know the literature better than me. The, um, yeah, so it's a, it's a big issue, and there's a lot of different sleep uh, problems in that population, and a lot of them are developmental, uh, you know, nightmares, night terrors, parasomnies, and you can kind of grow out of them. Um, we focus really on the delay, uh, this natural delay is the work that we've been focusing on, but there are other groups in the UK that are working on suicide, suicide ideation in adolescents. So there's a group in Glasgow um, at Strathclyde who are working on um, the peak of suicide thoughts uh, in terms of time of day um, and also looking at uh, sleep history and trying to find ways to use sleep as a kind of weather bell for those types of things. Uh, so that work is happening, but it's not something that, that I have direct involvement in. Okay, I think that with that question, we'll, we'll close the meeting. Thank you to all of you for your fantastic attention and to everybody that's made the meeting a success. I think the last session in particular shows us that there is much more to go and um, look forward to uh, hearing all the discoveries that come out of this meeting. Sleep well. Thank you very much. Thank you.